horticulture specialist with NCAT, and um, Jeff described ATRA, the Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, and I work with market gardeners and farmers um, throughout the country and on their production practices and their, and their business planning. And I work a lot with beginning farmers as well as farmers that have been at it for a long time, although they often teach me more than, than um, I can help them. <laughs> so, um, but today I'm gonna talk about uh, cover cropping as I've seen it throughout the country. I've, I've actually farmed in New York and Arizona and Montana. <laughs> and I've also worked with farmers throughout the country. And um, so I was just gonna talk a little bit about the national perspective and how that can apply to cover cropping strategies with farmers here in Montana. I'm mainly gonna be focusing on market gardens because that's who I work with. So. Anyways, um, with cover cropping, you need to think about the use of that cover crop. Like what is the strategy that you're going to employ, use that cover crop for? And um, the most common strategies on a farm are weed prevention, soil building, fertility, and then also one that is often overlooked is um, beneficial habitat. And um, so for, um, and a lot of these, a lot of these cover crops kind of overlap and they do multiple purposes. Um, they, they serve multiple functions within a farm. That's one awesome thing about cover cropping. But um, usually farms have um, a specific, specific strategy that they're, they're looking to employ on their farm when they're cover cropping. So um, specific principles for a cover crop that is gonna prevent weeds is you want something that's gonna grow really fast um, or it has, um, like buckwheat has really big cotyledons, their first leaves when they come up. Um, and, and I saw that Judy has a lot of buckwheat on her farm. And so they, that works really well in um, getting a head start above a lot of annual weeds. And then um, there's some crops, has, has, has anybody heard of the word allelopathy? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, certain, certain plants have um, allelopathic properties. In other words, they actually prevent plants from growing and they also pr prevent weeds from growing. And um, rye is really famous cover crop for doing that. Um, I, here are some examples of cover crops that work really well for as a weed management strategy. Um, this is um, sorghum sudan grass really puts on a lot of biomass that's where it serves multiple functions but it was super super um, aggressive crop and it can and it puts on a lot of growth really fast as long as you have a lot of water um, and then there's the buckwheat i was talking about and here's rye with the allelopathic properties so here are some and this is my my handsome son that's playing back there in our covered crop and our sorghum student cover crop on our little farm in Belgrade, Montana. The next <coughs> strategy would be soil building. And um, the new thing with cover cropping now is they call it cover crop cocktails. How many people have heard of cover crop cocktails? Okay, so that's the new thing with cover cropping now. And um, we just tried this on our farm. It's just starting to germinate. I'm not sure um, how, um, how well it's gonna do on our super sandy soil. But um, we all, we tried it, we've tried it at NCAD. We have a, a small demonstration farm there. And um, the idea with the cover crop cocktail is that you're satisfying multiple soil layers and then it's serving multiple functions. So there's a warm season grass, a cool season grass, some kind of um, deep root, like a radish or a turnip that kind of breaks the soil pan, and then some kind of legume that's gonna fix nitrogen. And so we did that exact same thing at um, the NCAT SIFT farm, and it has been working really, really well, but we'll have to soil test and see how, how well that works. But that's a really great um, soil building strategy is those cover crop cocktails. Yep. What was your accommodation? Um, that you mean the, the what we were using? Yeah. yeah, so we used um, radish, 
turnip, or radish, and then um, oats, Austrian winter peas, and um, and then there is one other and legume in there. I think we used the clover. Uh -huh. So, um, and that has worked really well. I have a picture of that one. So another thing, uh, sorghum Sudan grass is another cover crop that works really great for soil building. It puts on a ton of biomass, and then um, you can you can flail chop it or mow it or uh, even on a small scale just weed eat it down if you're over on your if you're under an acre and then that and and then water it um really well and keep watering it and then that act, then it'll keep growing and if you chop it two or three times you're getting a lot of biomass coming up from the from um from that particular crop and there's a there's a picture of our sorghum that has been chopped right there. Um, the greenhouse crop, that's our, our cover crop cocktail that I was describing. Um, we, we planted it, we, we, we got a bunch of topsoil, topsoil quote, donated um, to the NCAT SIFT farm. And um, it wasn't really topsoil, it was almost like subsoil. It just had really poor organic matter and um, just really poor fertility. So we've actually been taking some of one, one, we have four hoop houses there and we've been taking one hoop house this season and just really trying to put a lot of biomass and a lot of organic matter in those hoop houses. Uh, any, any question about cocktails or, um, yep. Yeah, in the hoop house, uh, do you leave it to uh, cover crop one year or do you enter crop or? We actually, and that's a, I, I was going to talk about that a little okay. bit later, but yeah. no, I, I'll talk about it now because it is something that you need to consider in your strategy. Hoop houses, they cost a lot of money per square foot. So, um, you know, you have to really need to take it out of production. I mean, we, we have four hoop houses that are quite large, so um, we feel like we can't afford to take one out. And it was just, it was really, this, the fertility was was um, making it a challenge to grow things in there. So we, um, we did take, we take one out per year um, in, in, the ro in the rotation. We rotate our crops for each, for each um, hoop house. But um, the next year with the Sorghum Sudan, um, we broad forked the, the Sorghum Sudan from last year and it winter killed. It's not, it's not, uh, cold hardy at all it winter kills um, really easily first frost and then um, and then that <coughs> has served as a mulch for our tomatoes this year and it's actually worked really really well um, so that's that's an, an idea too I'm not sure how it would work in like a field situation versus a hoop house situation that was all by its, the sorghum all by itself for years. Yeah, and I've heard um, some folks from NRCS are really pushing the cover crop cocktails, and I've heard them actually mention that you can use sorghum Sudan in a, in a mix, and I would be curious to see how that works because it is such a competitive crop. I personally have not used it in a mix, so um, I think it's, um, I, I have, I have, and I don't know other farmers that have, to be honest, too. But I think it works really well on its own. So, yeah. Now, I got a friend that used some last year on irrigated ground by Conrad, and he's then he's gonna try it again. And they say if you mow it off or hay it, it'll shoot more root. And he said it kind of hurt the Canadian thistles pretty good. Oh yeah, it is. It is one of the most competitive. You just have to have irrigation. You cannot use it in a dry land yeah. situation. Yeah. And in our little farm, you know, we do sprinkler irrigation on our cover crop, and it just, um, you know, on the hinter areas of where the um, it, the sprinkler reached, it was not near <laughs> as productive and actually would let some of the weeds in. So you really just have to irrigate it a lot. Yes, what would you use in a dryland situation with more drought tolerance? I know that some people have used the Austrian winter peas um, that uh, in the dryland wheat. I know um, famous organic wheat guy, 
um, Bob, Bob, yeah, <laughs> Bob Cran, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. He has used it in a dry land situation, I think, and it has, they have worked. You just have, so anytime you, you, you don't have irrigation or any, you know, you change those parameters, the, the seeding ratio goes way up. You definitely have to drill it down. You can't, in most, in a smaller scale situation, you can um, use a, um, you know, a spreader, but you would have to drill it in, in a dry land. Situation. If you don't terminate them on time, they start to steal really valuable, they do more valuable water, they do more harm than good in terms of a dry land situation though. So, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna talk briefly about using cover crops for fertility and then I'll talk, there seems like a lot of questions about how to fit it into a rotation and so um, there's, everybody knows I think most people know that um, legumes are, you know, your um, your primary source of getting um, of a of a cover crop providing nitrogen to um, a, to the soil. But there's also the um, there's certain crops that can mine um, existing maybe non-soluble sources of of um, of fertilizer into and bring that up into the to their 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 plant and their biomass and then you can break it down and um and buckwheat is actually kind of famous for doing that with phosphorus um phosphorus is is um is that the organic forms are not um very soluble so it is difficult for um for organic farmers to find other than manure to find good sources of, um, of non-synthetic phosphorus that can be easily broken down. A rock so. phosphate on, it can help get that up into, its, um, into the plant and then once it's broken down, it helps make it more available to subsequent plantings. And so, um, I didn't, um, and then obviously clovers are great in a mix. And the one thing you want to make sure if you are if you are looking if you are planting legumes is that you're having a lot of nodulation and then the nodules will be the indicator that there that that legume is actually fixing nitrogen and so i this is from our austrian winter peas on our farm um and then a lot of people love this crimson clover and say that it, it i haven't personally used it but um you don't oh okay and um we were over in San Ignatius, and they were using it in their um, their mix, and they said it was really great in fixing nitrogen. So I put that in here too. So, so I'm next going to talk about um, different cover cropping strategies and how they might fit into um, your overall crop plan. Um, so one way is if you if you take um, if you take a piece of land out for um, a whole a whole season, basically, and you fallow it, it's good to have that area that area covered, um, and um, taking it out of cash crop production. And so, in those situations, it's good to have a long season annual that you can um, that you can use. So um, sorghum Sudan is a really long season annual um, and buckwheat is a short season annual but sometimes what you can do is, is you, can, um, you can seed your buckwheat. That's usually maybe like 40, 50 days. It just depends on, what's that? 28. 28? Okay, well, <laughs> depends on where you're at. But yeah, so yeah, so 30 to 50 days, we'll say, and then you can, um, then once that's turned in, you can actually put something in that will do like a, um, like a, um, a, a wheat pea or an oat pea combination that will actually winter kill and will be ready in the spring. So that's, that's an idea of how to take um, a fallow piece of ground and just really renovate it with a cover crop for an entire season. Um, the next um, that I know a lot of people in Montana do, do you use a lot of just like winter cover crops that you plant in the fall and then they're, um, and maybe you could um, talk And about we do that a lot too. So we'll plant um, oats and peas. And this year um, we planted, we tried to do the, the cocktail combination too. We added a, we added a, a clover and, 
and some brassicas in there too um to to basically you plant it in the fall and then it puts on a little bit of growth in the um in the fall and then in the spring it really puts on the bulk of its growth if you have got a legume in there it's really fixing the bulk of its nitrogen at that point point. and then um, late spring early summer is when that's terminated and you um, and then you have either a, an area that you can use for a fall ground or that's ready for spring first thing in the in the following season so that's a strategy that a lot of farmers do here in Montana the main thing is that you need to make sure that the cover crops that you are using will actually make it through the winter. Um, and Austrian peas and um, oats are kind of iffy just depending on where you are. Rye and vetch is a really common um, uh, combination that people use. And then some people have been kind of mixing brassicas into that at this point too. So um, with the new cover crop cocktails. <laughs> um, and then the smother crops I already talked about, um, those can use, be used any time within your rotation. But, you know, um, if you see in, um, for example, you have an area that is super weedy um, the previous season and you know you're going to have a weed problem there next year, it might be a good strategy to take that out in the, um, in the, early spring and use that use a smother crop like the sorghum sudan or the buckwheat or something that i talked about earlier um, and then finally what judy does a lot of is interseeding crops and um, the main thing you need to be um, cognizant of with interseeding crops is that you need to make sure that they aren't going to be super competitive with your other crops i mean that's kind of a given but um, um so you don't want to use something like sorghum sudan or um, those the, the like the vetches that really spread a lot um, I know some people that have used those in an um, in intercropping situation and um, they do they do kind of become a problem after um, you know as the season progresses in an interseeding situation so and I saw that and and the buckwheat does although it is competitive but in an alleyway I think it does work pretty well in an interseeding situation because it attracts a ton of beneficials so you're also um, you know that that's one of those really great dual purpose crops so um, and so I was gonna talk just briefly how are we on time I'm, I'm like Okay. <laughs> I'm so fascinated. Just about some different um, planting and termination methods, and then with planters, um, it really depends on what what um, equipment you have available. Um, we have a really small farm, so we just use um, a, you know a spreader. But um, I feel like it has its limitations because the um, it does you require way more um, seed than what is usually recommended for a cover cropping if it, you were to drill it. And then, um, and then we don't, it's not getting, certain seeds require being covered, especially like Austrian winter peas or some of the bigger, the bigger cover crop seeds. Um, so those, it, it is a challenge with the spreader, but you can do it. And we, on our small scale, we go out there and wait, rake it, or some people use a, cult, you know, if you have a tractor, you can use a cultipacker. Um, I did, the farm I was at in St. Ignatius, Foothill Farm, they, um, two weeks ago, they actually use a spreader for their peas and they had a great stand of cover crops there, um, but they do cultipack it. So I think that was the key to their, high germination with all their different cover crops so um, even if you have to rent one or something um, yes yeah, so a drill obviously you need bigger equipment for that you need to invest in a drill but you're going to get higher germination if you have a, dr uh, have a drill so and then um there's there's a lot of different ways and i um to terminate the cover crop and it really just depends on what use you are you know what its use is on your farm you know a lot of people will go will graze cover crops you know if you have we we have chickens and so we put chickens on our cover crop after we've mowed it down um and um 
But a lot of people will mow, till, and then either fallow and you know plant the next year. Or um, a, one way that you can do it, but you will, if you have a more aggressive cover crop or something like a vetch, it's gonna not terminate it all the way. Is disking. Some people disk it. Um, all right. Um, and then, and then a, a lot of people um, that it, it's harder in the West, but if you're practicing no-till. The roller crimper is the, um, you know, the preferred method of terminating a cover crop, and um, but it's harder in the West. Um, in irrigated um, raised beds, they found that using a roller crimper actually does not um, fully terminate the cover crop, and they've had had challenges with weeds coming in and everything with that. Um, so, I think, I think no-till in the West is still. Um, uh, in the irrigated west is still a challenge that I think people are still um, working with, working through the issues with. <laughs>